Hi everyone, I'm Charlie Garcia, and this is episode 7 of Liquid Rocket Engines. Okay, okay, I know, it's been like forever. So what's been happening with the Liquid Rocket Engine program? First things first, I've moved. I'm no longer in Boston, I'm currently living in Colorado. And that means I've had to set up a whole new shop and get all my stuff transported out here. But after that happened, I was right back on the case. I've gone ahead and gotten some tanks, main valve actuators, I'm running tests on sensors for my liquid oxygen tank. I've gotten a ton of valves. And I've even got some cool electronic controlled solenoid valves in. And all that progress has just been on my liquid engine. In that time, I've also managed to finish my solid rocket motor. And start a few other projects. Alright, so without further ado, let's talk tanks. Tanks are easily one of the hardest and most expensive parts of any rocket engine project to source. They're so far outside of the norm for what you'd find in everyday life that it's just difficult to find a place that can get these tanks to you. Uh, for example, during my first liquid engine program, I was using PVC pipe as a tank because my pressure wasn't even 100 PSI, but that's obviously not an option for a rocket engine whose pressure is going to be over 500 PSI. During other rocket projects, I've looked at reusing titanium spheres from old Saturn V launch vehicles. Uh, that's not going to be an option for this project, I don't have the budget for that. Um, and I've also looked into welding my own stainless steel tanks, and even when I did have the budget to pay a commercial welder to create these cryogenic stainless steel tanks, I had a hard time finding a welder who'd even take the job. They all heard me say, cryogenic pressure vessel, and they disappeared without a trace. So, the question is, how can you get a pressure rated vessel that's relatively lightweight, made from materials that are compatible with both liquid oxygen and the fuels I'm going to be using, as well as get it for some semblance of affordable price. And it doesn't have an easy answer. You're going to have to make compromises. Um, in this case, I've gotten very, very lucky. And I found these tanks. So what is this? This is a beer keg. Yeah, 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 I hear what you're saying, but hear me out. It's rated for a pressure of 120 PSI, and it has a Department of Transportation mandated test safety factor of five. That means that this has been hydrostatic tested to 600 PSI before I even bought it. And the best part is, it only cost $90. And because of the greatest stainless steel it is, it'll work all the way down to cryogenic temperatures. There's only one problem. That doesn't match any of the fittings that I have on my rocket engine. Alright, so what can I do to connect my beer keg tank up to the rest of the plumbing in my rocket engine? That also turns out to be relatively straightforward. When you buy the keg, it comes with this. This is called a spear. And I don't know the first thing about brewing, uh, so I'm just going to have to guess here, but it looks to me like this is where you tap the beer out, uh, you pressurize up around here, and then beer flows up this tube and out the top. Uh, there's some kind of ball valve assembly up here. And then there's an o-ring right here where the uh, seal is formed to connect this uh, when this is inserted into the lip of the tank. So essentially what I need to do is I need to build one of these but more suited for my purposes. Because these tanks are going to be upside down when I use them, so I need uh, to take the liquid oxygen or the ethanol from down here and put the gas in up here at the top. Since there is only a single hole, I am going to have to pressurize uh, through this kind of like dip tube assembly. And so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to have two tubes. So this is a test piece I've been working on. This is a capacitive LOX level sensor. So um, to know how much propellant you have in your tank is sometimes a challenge. And so the way I've decided to get around this is this inner tube right here is going to have nitrogen or helium passed up through the middle of it up to the top of the tank. But then there's a fine space in between these two tubes and that space will fill with liquid oxygen or ethanol, as the tank fills with liquid oxygen or ethanol. And by connecting a sensor up to that, I can measure the capacitance of the space between those two tubes, which will tell me uh, what fraction of the space between those two tubes is filled with liquid. And that'll tell me how much liquid I have in the tank. So at the same time that I switched from using scuba tanks to beer kegs as my pressure vessel, I had to make a couple of other changes to the test stand design. And by the time I was making those changes, I decided to go ahead and make a lot of changes to the test stand to make it easier to build uh, and also not require uh, nearly as much effort to move around. So I switched from previously I had a uh, frame construction and now I'm using a single sheet construction. So if we look here, you can see both the new PID and the new uh, panel construction. And I haven't finished routing all the lines, but we can talk a little bit about what we've got here. 
All right, so here we see the assembly of the test stand. Uh, like I said, I switched from those two separate assemblies to this flat plate. So this flat plate right here is going to be 8th inch steel, and I can have this water jet so that all the holes for the locating features and the valves are in the right place. Um, and it's not entirely done yet, but just for a really quick overview of what I've got going on here, uh, we've got these two beer kegs. These are going to be uh, cabled back to the plate. Uh, they sit in little brackets. This right here is a LJ, uh, L45J um, COPV. Uh, it's going to get plumbed into several systems. Uh, there's two regulators here and here. These are uh, swage lock models. Uh, and then there's also going to be uh, a pneumatic system. Um, so this is a pneumatic valve block. And then uh, there's a second set of pneumatic valves here. Uh, the pneumatics drive uh, the new main propellant valves, which are here and here. Uh, as well as the pres uh, tank pressurization and vent valves, which are here. So these are three-way valves. Uh, so you've got the stem here, uh, the common leg, uh, the outlet, and then the inlet. So when the valve is closed, um, there's an L-shaped ball valve that connects this circuit here that then uh, connects to the tank here, so the tank is at ambient pressure. And then when the valve turns, it connects uh, this hose right here to this line right here, through the check valve, through the regulator, and up to the pressure end, which brings the tanks up to pressure. Uh, then uh, when, uh, this, uh, when pressure comes from this valve into this actuator right here, um, this opens. Uh, that allows propellant to flow from the tank down through the T, out through here. Uh, this right here is a fun little assembly. So this is the valve. This is a fitting right here uh, that then is adapted for a, uh, another AN fitting right here. So this is how I'm going to purge my engine lines is by connecting uh, that line up there uh, to the high pressure pneumatic lines through this check valve here. Uh, anyway, so long story short, uh, this is going to be a lot easier to make because I can have someone water jet this whole sheet for me and I don't have to weld anything. It'll all just come and it'll already be at exactly the right size. Uh, the things I will have to do, um, I'm going to have to drill and tap these fittings for the purge lines. Uh, I'm going to have to bend some custom sheet metal brackets. Uh, I'm going to have to machine these adapters that connect the pneumatic actuator to my valves that I've already got. Um, I'm going to have to weld these fittings right here. This is a swage lock fitting onto a um, uh, 0316 cap for the AN fitting uh, T-line right here. And that's actually what makes up the uh, capacitive lock sensor you can see here. Um, and it's got that one tube there. And if I go ahead and make that transparent, you can see the other tube even that's inside of it. So this one tube here, it terminates in a, um, uh, hello, go away please, thank you. It terminates in this uh, fitting right here. Um, and then the smaller tube goes all the way through and connects up to this quarter inch pressurization line, which connects up to the pressurization valve. Uh, so that's how pressure gets into the tanks. And then the engine will be uh, down here somewhere. Um, same design as before, uh, just not shown here yet because I haven't quite gotten that far. Anyway, so that uh, takes care of all the uh, CAD work. I'm still finishing uh, up the design, but I do have most of these pieces on order. So I have uh, all of these valves purchased. I have these actuators already in my shop. I have these valves in my shop. Um, I have the check valves that go down here that are not yet modeled in my shop. Uh, I have all of these fittings, all of these fittings, all of those fittings. I also have all the quarter inch fittings uh, for this. Um, I don't have any of the tubes bent, so that's going to be a lot of work. Um, I'm kind of thinking I may need to make a jig or a template or something so I can bend a lot of these repeatedly. Um, I'll need to get these brackets for the tanks water jet. Um, I still need to buy all of these pneumatic actuators um, and these pneumatic actuators. I do have the pneumatics for the uh, vent system uh, that hooks up here and here already in my shop. And I already have the COPV and both of the tanks. Uh, so really, once I finish modeling this, I can go ahead and get this uh, sheet ordered, which should just be a simple uh, water jet order, like 80 bucks or something cheap, uh, and then I can start bolting stuff together. Um, it's really going to hopefully come together quickly once I've got that, and then I can start testing the test stand side of things. 
uh, the engine has a lot more custom machine parts. I mean, if you look at this thing, the number of parts that I'm actually going to make are like one, two, three, four, uh, yeah. And then like five, six kind of, I just have to drill and tap these. So really uh, not a lot of, a lot of money to spend, but not a lot of work to do. Um, so I'm really, really overall pleased with this. I think this is gonna give a better result. Um, and it will support testing both this engine and both larger and smaller engines uh, in the days to come. All right, folks, that does it for episode seven. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you again hopefully sooner next time. Take care, good luck, and Godspeed.